Let's say you have a career you want to pursue abroad. If you didn't have any connections to that industry and the country you plan to move to, would you still go? Filipino entrepreneur Krista Francis de Sesto, or Haiku, did that more than a decade ago. She packed her bags from her home in Davao and flew to Dubai, where she was determined to pursue a career in photography. Now, even in her success as a creative director with her own globally recognized brand, she never forgets the community she came from. Hello, I'm Michelle Abad, and welcome to At Homes Abroad, Rappler's one-stop show for everything related to the Filipino diaspora. Here, we discuss topics important to Filipinos all over the world, from concerns and welfare of overseas Filipino workers, to celebrating Pinoy success stories, to reconnecting with cultural roots, at iba pa. For today's first fully in-person At Homes Abroad episode, we have the pleasure of sitting down with Haiku de Sesto, among the Junior Chamber International Philippines, the Outstanding Young Men Awardees for 2023. She was recognized for her advocacy in OFW empowerment. Haiku, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm just so, so excited to always be back home and yeah, to reconnect with everyone, with family and friends. Of course, and thank you for making time. So congratulations again on, on your award. So how have you been since the announcement? It's been so, so overwhelming. The amount of love and support has doubled more than ever. And I'm just trying to take it by the day, trying to enjoy it, and also trying to use it now even more further to expand whatever things that I have already been doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So maybe let's go back in time no, to mm -hmm. your journey as um, an OFW. So. Where did you grow up and what made you discover your passion for photography? I was born and raised in Davao City. My dad used to be a journalist, a cameraman. He's literally like a one-stop shop guy. Mm -hmm. Whenever I used to see him do his thing, I just see someone so passionate about his work. Mm -hmm. Like I could see that he was tired, exhausted, no sleep. But I could see someone enjoying his work so much. In the Philippines or yes, abroad? this was in Davao. Okay. Oh. So that's what I wanted to achieve. That made me go through the same career path that he did. Because mm -hmm. I was like, look, if my dad is having fun with what he's doing, it's so, so stressful. But then it seems like it's fun. Mm -hmm. I want the same thing too. So... It made me take mass communications, um, pursued that line of work, mm -hmm. um, but focused more on the photography and the, you know, the filming aspect of things, so photography and videography at the same time. Mm -hmm. So was it in your horizon to be like a journalist or talagang photography? Mostly, initially I wanted more journalism work. Mm -hmm. But then again, when I moved to Dubai, it was a lot more easier for me to be in commercial work. Mm -hmm. um, plus, it was, I mean, I'm in somewhere out of my comfort zone. So I kind of tried to just gauge it a bit where it was easier to kind of climb the ladder a little bit. So, yeah, start. Uh, I pushed through photography when I moved to Dubai. Na. Mm, okay. Mm. So let's go to that decision to migrate. Now. So you, were already, you already had the resources to start working in Davao. Mm -hmm. What made you decide to migrate? And... Back then, did you have a family that you needed to support? Was there any sort of financial pressure on you back then? So my dad was saying, so he moved to Dubai first. And then he was saying, I think it would be nice if all of us would move here. Mm -hmm. And then I had my son at an early age. I was 19. So my dad was like, I think it's nice to have a fresh start here. So the financial part was there. Obviously, my dad said that I could provide better for my son working overseas. So what we did, um, I moved first. And then once I started like becoming stable, I started moving to getting my son and my mom to move to Dubai until the whole thing, the whole plan was successful now. All of us was there. Mm. Mm. But your father went ahead of you. Yes, Amaba. so he used to work in Saudi also. Mm -hmm. So we've been away from each other all these years. And I think one of the reasons or like the, what you call this, the icing on top of the cake that made him, let's get all together, was his grandson. 
-hmm. He was like, right, this is, we, ha we, ha we all have to be together now. Mm -hmm. Like us being separated as a family is, is difficult. Right. So when, uh, um, yeah, when I gave birth to my son, he said, okay, it's time. Let's all be together. Let's make, let's start making the plan to mm -hmm. be all together again. How long had your father been abroad by the time that he decided that? Oh, he left when I was, I think I was 12. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, 11, 12. Actually, he worked overseas before mm -hmm. getting married. And then when he married my mom, he was like, okay, enough. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to be here. Like, I'm based in the Philippines again. And then I was going to high school and college. And my father was like, right, I need to... Uh, so I need to give you a better shot at life, better school. So that's what made him decide to work overseas again. Mm, okay. And then your son, um, how old was he when you were able to bring him to Dubai? It was just after his second birthday. Okay. Which was very funny because when he moved to Dubai, all he could because he, he didn't speak English at all. So all that he could speak was yes, no, go. <laughs> and now it's kind of the opposite. So we're having to get him to reconnect with his roots and to learn how to speak Filipino again. So what languages does he speak now? So now he does. He speaks English, uh, mostly English. And then in school, because they have French, Arabic. But at home, obviously, as a Filipino mom, then mm -hmm. when you get angry, Bisaya and Tagalog. Okay. Mm. Okay. So going back a little now, so... Um, you were already working a bit in mm -hmm. photography in, in Davao. Going to Dubai without any connections seems quite like a risk, mm -hmm. you know? So even if you have family and, and you plan to bring everybody there, but would you consider yourself a risk taker? Or, or was this the very first risk that you took? Well, me, kasi, I set goals. So whatever could get me to that goal, I Sometimes I forget nga na I'm taking risks na pala. Mm -hmm. So our goal was for the family to get there, me to provide for my son better. So I was like, right, okay, let's go straight. Now, when I arrived in Dubai, I actually already said that um, I think it's going to be hard to do production life here because I don't know anyone. So for the first few months, I think my, the first time I arrived there, the work that I was applying for were mostly the easy ones, like be a receptionist, be a, something that is not connected to photography mm. at all. I see. But I sent my CV to a few productions, and then I had one call. It was a photography studio that was there. Um, the good thing in Dubai is there is a market for female photographers and videographers because there's a lot of female-only shoots. Mm -hmm. So it didn't matter if it was a male-dominated world in general. So I was like, you know what? What's the worst that can happen? I was like, if it doesn't work, I'm going to go to an easier job or another job, or I'll always find a job anyway. Mm -hmm. So then I took that risk of sh um, working for that photography studio, which was a bit tough because at that time, they weren't really accepting a lot of Filipino photographers and videographers. So, it was quite, not quite, I'll be very honest, it was tough in the beginning because they wouldn't even put me forward at first. But then, that's where I pushed myself harder and I had this one shoot. So, they actually missed schedule a shoot where the photographers that were supposed to be shooting it got overbooked. Mm. So, they threw me um, randomly. Sige na nga, you shoot na. And then it became so successful that they switched na. So all of the shoots, they passed it on na over to me. The good thing though, after from there, they started hiring Filipinos na. Because mm. before, it wasn't as easy like it is now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Actually, I wanted to uh, know more about the mm. challenges in the beginning. And all. So you, you mentioned that before you got into photography in Dubai, you tried doing other jobs first. Mm. How long did you have to go through that? Ooh, I think it was I think for the first three months. Because mm. before, um, you can't. Uh, it was difficult to just walk in and find a job. Mm. So I think I was able to get my first job on my first visit there. 
Um, visa processing is always a lot more difficult compared to now. Yeah. So, n like having to have options to jump from one work to the other if you didn't like it, like before it has to be like you have to finish your contract. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think one good thing about it before too was you really need to be sure about what you want. Because it's not like you can just, okay, I don't want it anymore and then move to other work. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then when you got into uh, photography, na, ano, um, you mentioned how it was so difficult for you to mm -hmm. get jobs and like to, for you to be recognized. Mm -hmm. it, as part of those um, challenges, was there discrimination? Was there um, maybe racism thrown at you? Were, were, mm -hmm. there, or, were, were the Arabic photographers given more priority? Or did you notice, or maybe even you know, white people, white people? Mm -hmm. um, um, Photographers and artists. Mm. Where did, did you notice that they were given more priority than you, or anibang mga discrimination, if ever, um, did you experience? I think it was more of the like Arabic countries in general. They're very male, 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 male dominated. Okay. You know, like so being a girl, it was tough, but. I used it to my advantage. Because, say, example, they can't touch you. You put your tripod there. They can't just push you and shove you around. So then, even the tripod, they can't yeah, you touch can't. You. Okay. Because if I complain, they have a lot of respect for women, so they can't just shout at women in general. So I kind of just use that in my advantage. Now, I think what I struggled the most. One of the I had a project where I was hired as a photographer, but they ended up putting me in the back room. So I was like, right, this is not what I'm supposed to do. I had my gears, I had this, I had that. They were like, um, yeah, but you don't fit the bill along with the other photographers that were there. So I was like, what do you mean? And I started noticing, right, okay. But one girl approached me, though. She was like, um, as much as you see it as race, it was more that I didn't have UAE experience at all. So it... At some point, it didn't matter if you're lalo na now. It doesn't matter anymore if you're Filipino or or other or like um, Caucasian or Arabic. What matters more now is what experience you have. So that's where I understood it. Because in the beginning, I was kind of thinking maybe this is a race thing, and I think my mom and dad saw at some point that I would cry about it because I can't change my race. I can't change my skin tone. So. All that I could change was be better and have a better portfolio and have a stronger portfolio that at some point they won't see race anymore. And then we had one project too, actually. There were two bids. It was our prod, which was mostly Filipinos, and then another prod that was mostly other nationalities. And I was like, look, let's just prove ourselves better. Let's just do better work that, yeah, again, they, don't, they won't see race, but they just see work. Mm -hmm. And they choose from there. Mm -hmm. So going through those challenges and really asserting yourself and making space for yourself in the industry, what gave you the confidence to take it a step further and go from being a photographer to being an entrepreneur and putting up your own company? Being an entrepreneur was uh, super, super accidental, super unplanned. Um, so the reason I left the studio that I was working before and went on my own, I just really wanted to have more time with my son. Because my schedule before was so back to back and I just wanted to, like, you know, like when other people think of going abroad, they want financial freedom straight away. Our story was different. Ours was to be a family all together. So I went back to the core of what I, what my reason was to be there. And I was like, look, I'm not having enough time with my son or my family. So I started working for myself first. It was just me. And then clients keep on coming in. So I was like, right, I can't do this anymore. Let me hire one more person. Mm -hmm. Of course, as a Filipino, I'd hire a fellow Filipino first as a priority because there's the comfort zone in there. And then it kept on growing, bless. And then I just had to hire more people. It was at the living room of our house before, up to like, right, we can't function properly or work here properly na. So we ended up getting an office. And then it grew again. It just all naturally grew. We expanded the office to now we have the warehouse studio that we're operating at. Mm -hmm. Okay. How did you decide to make it formal na? 
right? Because like you were hiring and mm. hiring, and then mm. you started to get an office. Mm. How did you know that it was time? I think it was more of the visa system. Like I can't hire people without giving them proper visas. So to have a proper visa, you need um, to give proper visas. You have you need to have a proper workspace uh, for your trade license to be activated and all that. Mm -hmm. So it was just. You know what? What's the worst that can happen if it doesn't work out? I shoot again myself. Mm -hmm. So then one day it was, we looked at offices, arranged the trade licenses so we could employ people properly, not anymore on a freelance basis. And yeah, that was it. Mm -hmm. So what were the challenges in the beginning of your, mm -hmm. of your what, do you, what, do you call, what do you call it, a studio? Mm -hmm. or, yeah, what was the beginning challenges of it? I think that, yeah, one, the visa situation. Mm -hmm. It's because um, rules in the Middle East change a lot. You know, like um, it's having to, it's so, so fast paced out there that even the rules change from time to time. So it, it was having to keep up with those changes. Second, um, I think one of our main struggles too was having to make sure that because most of the people that we've employed are fresh from Dubai because what I really wanted were people who didn't have a shot to go to the Middle East. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think one struggle was most didn't have UAE experience. So having to adjust to clientele, how they speak, how they talk, what the, the standards of work were. I think that was my main, main, main struggle and having to instill that to team members and employees to make sure that our quality of work stays the same. Mm. So if I understood correctly, your priority in hiring people really mm. from Filipinos from outside UAE? From here in Dubai, uh, from here in the Philippines. From here in the Philippines, yes. okay. Because I, I, I experienced it, yeah. how tough it was to, to look for work there. I think there was one day um, I was holding a pack of, C, uh, of CVs and I remember it clearly, it was about 52 to 53 degrees in heat. And of course you wear your turtleneck and suit and all your formal. And I was going to building to building and I think my, there was that one moment, a pivotal moment where I gave my CV to whoever was in the reception and then she took it and then she turned around and then it went straight to the and I was like, right. I didn't want anyone else to feel that way again. So even now in our studio, we have people walking in giving their CVs. So I'd say, look, you know what? Just take it, give water back and we'll review it. If not, keep those CVs in. There are other friends that have businesses as well, and maybe if it fits them, we'll pass it over. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think that was my drive. I just didn't want anyone to feel that same struggle of work, of getting into working overseas. So our first vision was to get employees from here in the Philippines to move over there. Yeah, and that's wonderful because like, I would imagine or I would assume that hiring Filipinos with UAE experience would be Is advantageous, one. Yeah. right? Uh -huh. But it, it would be imagined as your disadvantage if you were hiring people who have no experience mm. in UAE. Mm. So when you were um, training these new hires mm -hmm. from the Philippines, was it difficult? Or did you, did you train your senior staff to have more patience with them? No, it was more me direct. Like, mm, um, but our, my process or our process in general is I let them shoot with me. Like, um, I'm not a very um, ABC one, two, three. I'm more of like, come observe, show. I'm sometimes, not sometimes, most of the time, I'm a very tough love person too, but it's just having to balance it out. Um, it's getting the job done, making sure, because the tough love comes in with them having to learn fast. There, um, look, now there's, I mean, we're good. There's someone better in the next two days. Mm -hmm. So, and then, yeah, there's other nationalities involved that play in the, um, play in the game too. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, yeah, it was, I think the pressure from my side was, it was coming from having to train them fast, but I didn't know how difficult it would be until our first batch. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's Mahila. But okay, it's working. Mm -hmm. But what I'm so happy about is, especially the first three, four batches that we've had, we kind of became their stepping stone. 
So then after that, they move forward, and it's also very good to hear where they are now. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. Sige. So let's go to um, your future work or the work that came later on. You know? So you've had the opportunities to work with big-time companies. You know? So I've, I've mm. read online, uh, Dolce & Gabbana, Vogue, uh, Tommy Hilfiger. Mm. How did you get these opportunities? Was it a matter of being persistent in trying to get them as your clients or did they find you after looking at your other works? You know what? Up to this very date, we still don't have a website. Okay. No website, no nothing. I genuinely just wanted to make friends because mm -hmm. I'm an only child and it's an automatic thing for you like to make friends with others. And then sometimes in shoots, I get bored. So like I'd, I'd talk to one person like, hi, what's your name? Da, 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 da. Or, and they ended up l genuinely liking me and then having a conversation and then the conversation is like, hey, can I have your number? Let's get in touch. Wait, what do you do again? It's like, I'm actually a photographer. It's like, oh, we need, we need the project this, this, this. There's even one time, uh, it was just hanging out outside, and one guy needed a pen. So I was like, yeah, yeah, I have a pen here. Mm -hmm. And then he was like, oh, thank you. What do you do? It's, well, I'm a photographer. I'm this. I have my production. And he was like, oh, I actually work for this firm. Um, let me get you guys on board. So it was just, I think it comes from genuinely just wanting to make relationships and connections with people. And what's great about that, though, is it's not just a one-job project or a pitch. Most of our clients, they start as clients, and then we develop a relationship where we become friends. And because in the Middle East, everyone doesn't have as much family members, so we ended up being an instant family. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, no, up to this date, we don't have a website. It's still coming soon, <laughs> which I think we need to and how, fix. How old is the company now? It's 12 years old this year. Okay, okay. Um, still so, no website. Yeah, even our friends are like, how did you grow this much? Like, um, how did you get clients back to back? It's, I just go out, I, I go out, talk to people, meet people, and then most important thing is, we make sure that our work is good because mm -hmm. because it comes from a relationship like that i ended i end up being uh, being friends with these people that if we mess up the work we also mess up the friendship mm -hmm. so that's why my quality or my standards for work is a lot more higher because i don't want to lose friends mm -hmm. um, so yeah we just make sure that Work is always as much up to par and at great standards. Because, um, yeah, I just want to keep my friends around. Mm -hmm. And now I have more friends more than ever apart from them being clients. So would you say that the success of your business is really attributed to you going out there and making friends and mm. building trust mm. with, with clients? And would you say that they also connected you to others with word of mouth? Mm. Ganun? It was because... Ganito. Um, in the Middle East, or in Dubai in general, your classmate since kindergarten is your classmate until high school before you go to university. So everyone becomes really, really close and tight. So, example, you penetrate that circle, they love your work, it gets passed around to that circle. And then one person in that group also has another circle. So then it gets passed on again, too. Mm -hmm. But that's the thing. Um, you have to make sure that you do good job, uh, sorry, a good job all the time. Because if you also mess up one, you're going to lose everyone as well. So, yeah, like um, everyone there is very word of mouth. Like, the, sorry, the word of mouth in terms of passing on contacts, network, is very, very, very strong. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess that's why it worked, or whatever I did, or just having to make connections in person worked. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, so let's go back to the reason you went to Dubai in the first place, you know, which was for family. Mm -hmm. So, um, how were you able to balance taking care of your, your family and also advancing in your career this much? I still go back to the main goal, which is we wanted to be together and spend time. So as much as 
even if we get so, 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 so busy, or sometimes I'm so, so exhausted, I go back to my goal that I still have to be there for my son. Or I still have to make time to call my parents or my family. Or I still have to make time to go out and hang out as a family. Because when I get exhausted, that's also where I get my strength back again. It's when we're together, it's when we're having a core memory, and um, something, that's something that I hold on to. Like, um, sometimes I get so, so exhausted. Like, even before flying here, it was so, so hectic. And then all of us went to the beach, and then it was just hanging out all together. Um, my mindset switched. I was like, okay, I'm ready to be stressed again. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think, I don't know, my main, main core talaga is family. Mm -hmm. And that's why also it means a lot to me for our team members, for them to be very family-oriented also. Mm. Were there times ever that your family was like, um, tumigil ka na mag-work, uh, stay at home, let's bond? Or have you, or has your son ever complained that you're not around so much? Or mm. may ganyan ba? Um, what we did, we sat down with my son. And I was like, look, there are times that we get really, really busy. I might not be able to help you out with homework a lot. Mm -hmm. But I had a friend who told me, in any aspect in life, it's more of quality more than quantity. It's like, because you have the mom guilt sometimes, you know, that there are times where you're not there every day, all day, because I'm at work. Mm -hmm. So we sat down with him and we said, like, look, um, let's make more quality quality time and core memories rather than we might be together watching TV every day, but you're just on your phone. Mm -hmm. So that's what my friend told me. Like, it doesn't matter. It's, it's what you make out of things. Like, you may have five minutes with your son, but you have a quick hug. Or you might have a two-minute call with your mom, but you say as much I love yous. Um, so, yeah, I think that's why I never felt bad. And we made, we made it to a point that our son understood but whenever he also says, Mama, I really want you to be there. If I have a shoot that I know I can move, I'll move it. Because mm -hmm. I know he understands. But if he already says, can you really be there? Then erase. I'll move things around talaga. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I notice in your social media, you're very active mm -hmm. in your community. Mm -hmm. Now, so um, I'm also wondering... After all of this, and even despite your busy career, like how do you give back to your OFW community? One, I think, is the jobs. Like um, This is the main reason I want our production to grow, is for me to be able to employ more. Also, now not even just to Filipinos, but to other nationalities also. Um, main priority, Filipinos pa rin talaga. Um, I think... Second, I just want to lead by example. Now, when other people see how much growth I have, it pushes them to maybe take a risk also and to not think twice of maybe taking a leap because there's someone that at least you can look up to that it worked. Mm -hmm. Especially my story is very non-traditional. My hair is non-traditional. Like, um, it's, everything is non-traditional. How I grew the business was also non-traditional. So I guess maybe if they have an example as that, that you don't have to be a, you know, a graduate of this or to learn everything by the books, but it, it can work. And sometimes you just need to see someone who made it work. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think I'm just trying to be the best that I can be so others see that too. And then on top of it, when they see me be active in community work there as well, this is the best thing about it, is I have now other Filipinos knocking on my door saying they want to be a part of it. So it becomes a domino effect um, in the long run. Mm -hmm. So basically, you can call me a mascot or just someone that they can look up to and as an example, um, and time and effort. So whenever there's a, an overseas Filipino worker that's distressed, it doesn't have to be someone I know. Sometimes I get a random knock on the door because for some reason they have the address and the phone number. But I just try to help in as much ways as I can. Mm. Mm. 
why do you think it's important or why is it important to you that you still support you know for your fellow OFWs, um, fellow Filipinos who might not have the same level of success as you do, especially since in the day to day you probably have it in your head na ito na yung buhay ko, this is the success that I have. Mm-hmm. Why do you s- still find it important to look and um, help and support your community? Cheesiness aside, it makes me happy talaga. Like um, in general me, I'm as a person lang, I'm happier when others are happy. Say example, come to let, let's explain like it's my birthday. I'm happier when I see others are having fun more than I would. Mm-hmm. So it's the same thing as if I help other Filipinos too, I see them grow and be better, or I help them out with their problems. It makes me happy also. Um, it may take a lot of me. It may take a lot of my time and effort, or sometimes I'm from a shoot and then someone needs help at 2 or 3 in the morning. Someone distressed, we'd still try to help them out. I, it just genuinely makes me happy talaga. Mm-hmm. Um, as much as I can, it also pa- makes me power through. Um, it makes me push myself even harder. Because if I could help some, um, like a couple at the level of where I am, if I push myself to be harder and hopefully be on a bigger platform, it means I can help more. Mm-hmm. It means I'll be happier too. So, yeah, I, I just use it now to push myself to be better so I can share and give as, uh, even more. Mm-hmm. So what would your advice or message be to Filipinos, OFWs, um, who want to pursue their dreams in advocacy abroad, especially those who feel discouraged? I think for me, what I could suggest or advice is to have a goal, to have a plan. So, and stick to that goal and stick to that plan. So, in case it gets tough, you have something to hold on to. Because working overseas is, if not, it's the, it's, it's the hardest. You're away from your family. You're alone. You don't know if people around you are loyal or not. Um, it's, it's risks that you don't know if someone's going to save you. But when you stick to a goal, you would always make things happen. And I think that's what worked out for me. Because there's a lot, a lot of times that I wanted to give up already. Especially during COVID time. I remember I called my dad. And um, I was like, oh, this is really tough. Um, I think I don't like it anymore. Or I don't know what to do. No, I didn't say I didn't like it. I said I didn't know what to do. And he was like, look, you know what? I shut it down. What's the worst that can happen? And it was that tough love. I called him straight away. And I was like, no, I'm okay now. <laughs> Opened my laptop, created the plan, and it worked. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah. I think it's just to have a goal, stick to that goal, stick to that plan, because that worked out for me, that worked out for my family, and it's now also what's helping me push myself harder and make me grow even more. Okay. All right. I think we can end on that note. Thank you so much, Heike. Thank you. Thank you. Again, you're tuned in to At Home Sa Abroad on Rappler. But the conversation doesn't have to end here. If you're interested to talk more about the lives of migrant Filipinos, you can join the Overseas Filipinos chat on the Rappler Communities app. You can download the app by scanning the QR codes on the screen. I'm Michelle Abad. Thank you for listening.